Welcome to Indoctrination, a weekly conversation series about protecting yourself from systems of control. I'm your host, Rachel Bernstein. Hi, everyone. Today on the show, I am very happy to be introducing two people. Lola Blanc is a singer songwriter, filmmaker, actress, and cult survivor. Her single, Angry Two, has over 20 million streams on Spotify. And as a songwriter, Blanc has also written for other artists, including Britney Spears. Blanc's work as a filmmaker has been spotlighted by Billboard, Fangoria, Funny or Die, and the prestigious short film channel Amaletto. Much of her work is inspired by her childhood practicing Mormonism, where she and her mother fell prey to a charismatic prophet, in quotes, who turned out to be a cult leader. Megan Elizabeth is a stand-up comedian, writer, and actress from Los Angeles who has performed at the legendary Laugh Factory. She was raised in a high-control Christian group known as the Two by Twos, an international home-based new religious movement that has its origins in Ireland at the end of the 19th century. Among members, the church is typically referred to as the truth or the way. And together, Lola and Megan co-host a podcast called Trust Me, Cults, Extreme Belief, and the Abuse of Power where they share their experiences and fight the stigma cult survivors are often exposed to. On the show, they have interviewed survivors of groups like Nexium, the Manson Family, Heaven's Gate, the Children of God, and many more. And I got to speak with them on their podcast a few weeks ago, and it was really fun. They're great women, and I'm excited you're going to be able to hear from them today. Here are Megan and Lola now. I want to very warmly welcome Lola and Megan to the Indoctrination Show today. I'm so happy to be speaking with both of you. I want people to check out your Trust Me podcast. I love the title of it. (laughs) Thank you. So I would love for each of you to introduce yourselves and then we'll start talking. So Lola, you want to take it away first? Yes, my name is Lola Blanc. I am a filmmaker, actress, singer, songwriter, and of course, podcaster with Trust Me. And um, my own cult experience was a Mormon offshoot mini group with a self-proclaimed prophet. And we will get into that in a bit, but that's the gist of me. I'm Megan Elizabeth. I'm a stand-up. I'm a podcaster. I'm a writer. I have a band. I'm a person in Los Angeles, and I was raised in the two-by-twos. So it's a pretty strict religion that uh, is very culty. So that's why I'm so interested in this stuff. So as a fellow person in LA, I will say (laughs) uh, that I have heard of the two by twos. I've worked with some people who were involved. And what's so interesting about this group is it's been around a long time and it has remained in the shadows. And so I'm so glad that you're bringing some light to it and other groups like it that uh, have remained small, have really kept people from going public about it. And so that's why they stay in the shadows. But it's a perfect example, I think, from both of you, with Mormonism being a term that people recognize, but might not really understand, but still recognize. And then the two by twos, where people might wonder if that's a dance step and not necessarily, (laughs) right? Um, But that they have the same characteristics, as I'm sure you've shared notes, right? And as I've heard on your podcast. And so it doesn't mean uh, that something is a cult because it's large or because it's smaller. It's all the same kind of control and manipulation, sometimes with different terminology, but basically a lot of overlap and a lot of similar after effects, which you've probably also commiserated about. Oh, yeah. 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 I find Megan's group very interesting because there wasn't like one specific guy at the top who was like dictating what they, I mean, at least that they could visibly see. That's not something I'm very familiar with. Whereas mine's the opposite. Mine is just one guy. He is the ultimate power. He is the one, he is the prophet, you know? 
Right. It's interesting. And I do want to hear more about that because that's an interesting distinction. And people will say, well, if there's no one kind of at the helm who is specific, how can this group exist or how can it be a cult without that? And it still can be. There are actually plenty of cults that I've come across where the leader is in jail or the leader has died. It still exists and it still keeps going, usually because of the control that has been embedded in the followers so that they keep themselves in line and they don't need some, they have like the voice of the leader in their heads. Right. Kind of like me with my ex-boyfriend. Yeah. (laughs) Actually, there was in the beginning one man who, who was like, Hey, I have an idea. And this was a very long time ago, but then he was like, wait, never mind. I don't like it anymore. And then he got kicked out. So it's kind of fun. (laughs) <laughs> it's kind of fun. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. So then I wonder, and, and you're right, Lola, I'm mean, talking about your ex-boyfriend. Not that I'm saying you're right about him because I've never met him, but it is true that there are people who do get under our skin and into our heads and we hear their voice and that can carry for a long time. And also with some religiously based groups, there is the sense that sort of God is is wanting you to do these things. So you're having kind of a dialogue with God. So you don't need the leader. Was that what you experienced, Megan, when you were growing up, kind of leaderless? Well, um, the two by twos in particular has something called workers, which are people who just grew up in the faith or join the faith later. And they kind of give their life over to not have a home and not have any possessions. And they are our leaders, but there's thousands of them. Okay. And so then Lola, I'm curious to hear more about what this offshoot of Mormonism is that you were raised in. Yeah. So this man whom I shall not name, because boy, does he love to try to sue everyone. He basically targeted my mom at a Mormon singles dance. And he has done this many, many times. He now has a whole big group. But at the time, it was really just my mom and like a couple other people But my mom had a really isolating experience. He claimed that he was translating the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon, which for anyone who's not familiar with what that means in Mormonism, basically the founder of Mormonism, Joseph Smith, he translated the original scriptures, the Book of Mormon from an angel. And there was a piece, there was like a big chunk of the book that was hidden away to be revealed in the last days. So this sort of leaves an opening for predators to come along and be like, hey, I'm like Joseph Smith translating the sealed portion of the scriptures from an angel. So that's kind of what he preyed upon and it escalated. I mean, obviously, the process of indoctrination took time. It took a lot of manipulation. He involved other people. He created fake email accounts to act like he had more followers than he did and eventually convinced my mom that he was the prophet. I mean, he had the, you know. It read like real scriptures and the whole thing. And oh, I'm missing the the like key component of the story here, which is that my mom had actually had a dream about a man and it felt really significant. It felt really meaningful. She meets this guy at a singles dance and he looks like the man from her dream. And he prays on that, of course. And I ended up believing in him when I found his letters to her. And then it was kind of my mom and I in this little tiny cult together. Mm, Okay. I was just going to say that's the first episode of Trust Me we ever did was we talked to Lola's mom and it's by far my favorite episode. So if anybody wants to listen to that, I mean, it's just textbook. So word for word, what can happen to a really smart person? I love listening to her. I think that's a very powerful story and you're right. I mean, this is how very bright people People who have critical thinking, people who have had a life where they've been able to exist without being involved in kind of just magical thinking, how they get drawn in. I think so many people are looking for signs. And when something is interpreted as a sign, we really want it to be so. We want it to be the thing that we're looking for. And I think then you also enter into kind of the slippery slope world of false correlations. Right. Totally. Yeah. And LDS culture in particular, and I I always feel like it's important to just note this, like the culture that I grew up in as a Mormon child was one that would talk about having visions, would talk about praying something, then getting a feeling about it, would talk about 
seeing signs and, you know, like it's very much embedded in the culture, at least at least where we were growing up. I'm, maybe that's not true of all Mormons, but it definitely primes people to think magically, basically. Mm -hmm. And that can become kind of a drug in and of itself, just the magic. It's hard to want to leave the magic, you know? I mean, even if it defies logic or even if it's leading you astray, still there's something really very attractive about it. And it really does connect with the brain centers very much like a drug. And people go through withdrawal when they leave something magical and all that it was supposed to be and all that it promised to be. It's very hard. That is very hard. So I'm, I'm wondering a little bit more about this offshoot I know so many of these groups also have woven into, and also with two by twos have woven into them misogyny. And so how did you see that play out? I'm assuming, but how did you see it if it was there? How'd you see it play out in your groups? Well, in my case, I mean, he literally wrote a book. Um, oh, I, sh I feel like I shouldn't say the name of it, but the, essentially the, the gist of the title is something like, um, the journal of a pimp or the journal of a womanizer, so a, a title similar to that. Um, so I actually read it a couple of years ago and I couldn't get through it because it, it was so disgusting. He would basically, it's, he's actually really, really fascinating because I feel like with so many of these cult leaders or these, you know, manipulators, you don't know whether or not they believe their own crap. And in this case, he pretty explicitly lays out how that he does not. And one of the things that he talked about in this little book he wrote is how he, these like elaborate schemes that he would come up with to convince women who were, you know, who believed in waiting until marriage to have sex or whatever it is to have sex with them and coming up with the, like these like very elaborate ways to kind of con them into sleeping with him when it was against their beliefs. Basically, the doctrine was that um, you don't need to actually get married. God has told him you just need to spiritually get married, which means just sleeping together, which means just sleeping with him, of course. The very abbreviated version is that he also, um, my mother was essentially sex trafficked and he sort of like sent men to her while she's like fully suicidal, whatever. I mean, women were just completely not treated as human. It's horrific. There's some work that I've been doing in conversations I've been having with some people, some women who are connected to something called the Avery Center, which is kind of a counter sex trafficking group. And there are a number of people who are connected to that center because of having experiences within religious groups, within cultic groups, which is kind of fascinating. And people don't know that it exists. And so I'm really glad that you're pointing it out, actually. Really glad. It's a difficult thing to to look at actually yeah yeah i mean it's it's such a contradiction we don't really want to think that people in positions of a religious authority would be the ones you know make doing such horrific things but it happens all the time yeah mm -hmm. to go back to your point about how he was the, this person who will remain nameless you know that he was so shameless and was so upfront about who he really was, at which I think when people show such hubris, I think it's because really they know they're going to get away with it and they've gotten away with way too much leading up to that point. So they don't even have to hide their true intentions anymore, which is always interesting to me. Yeah. I mean, I just, I find him endlessly fascinating because he will kind of go back and forth. He'll be like, oh yeah, I made all that up, obviously. And then he'll be like, that was a test. Did you, did you stop having faith when I said that? That was a test, you know, and it just, it just vacillates. And at this point, he has dozens of followers who have been with him on this roller coaster. And I think at this point, it's just so hard to get off because how could you believe that you would be fooled that many times, you know, and like have the truth right there in front of you and not be able to see it? Like, I mean, I just can't imagine. Right. And that's part of the gaslighting, too, that uh, from one day to the next or one hour to the next, you know, he'll say something different that either he means it or he doesn't or he believes something or he doesn't. And you just have to go along with it. There are a lot of people who will tell me that after they left their cult, they left kind of being in this suspended animation. They just had to go along with 
the logic of the moment and the reality or the truth that hour and be fine with it. Because then if you weren't, you would lose standing in the group. Or if you believed that the leader was connected with God, then you would be out of favor with God. And so it's, a lot of people talk about being kind of on emotional or spiritual automatic pilot. And until some people will say, okay, I'm done. I can't, this doesn't make sense to me anymore. It can't be that it's everything and both things and different on Tuesday than on Monday. What an interesting pattern that there are so many that just constantly contradict themselves. I mean, I guess, is that just like a narcissism thing? Like what? Yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't you think they'd want to be consistent in their doctrines? I don't know. I just want one tenth the energy of a narcissist. This man just writes <laughs> books upon books about nonsense. Ugh. Oh, it's so frustrating. I know they're so productive. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So to answer your question, the narcissist will do what it works for them in the moment. They don't have an allegiance to anyone except for themselves. They don't need to make sense. They don't have to say the same thing. They don't have to be consistent. What they really get off on, for lack of a better term, is just seeing that people will follow whatever they say, no matter what they say, and no matter how contradictory they are. And that it also is a way to keep people not being able to master the system, which narcissists also really like. Uh, and they like keeping people on edge. And so if they're the same every day, then you can predict what they're going to say, and you can predict the pattern, and and then you might master it, and then you might think you understand. And if they want to remain up here and everyone down there, they're going to keep people guessing, kind of push people down for something that would have been fine the day before, but now they get punished for. And that really is to keep people kind of hoping for the next moment when they're going to be able to be in someone's good grace. And it, it kind of makes people like puppies kind of following to see if you're going to get a pat on the head or. Oh yeah. Been in that cycle before. Yeah. So how did that play out in your group? Well, it wasn't as poignant as Lola's situation, but it was just very low grade, normal Christianity. Like women obey your husbands. Husbands are the head of the household. Men are better than women. We are made in God's image. He made the apple, uh, you know, just your typical Christianity uh, with just a, a, a little like volume up in that the men look completely normal. Um, you would never know. Oh, that's a two by two men, man. Whereas the women look like uh, straight out of the 1800s. So it's a little sexist. I don't think if the men had to dress that way, the rule would be there. <laughs> <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very true. Very true. I spoke with this woman who's going to be on the podcast and she's on TikTok. She was raised in a group that was like the Duggars. And yeah, she also talks about having to wear prairie dresses, right? And have your hair very long. And yeah, the men look normal, quote unquote. But very often you see this. And you see this in FLDS and you see in a lot of groups where the women wear floor length, everything and no makeup. And yeah, that was my uh, aesthetic. So, yeah, that's what my mom, that's, my mom has never worn jewelry or worn her hair down. It's always in a bun and no makeup. No, 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 nothing. It's, it's very, uh, it's very sexist. Yeah. Very sexist. Right. And so when you were growing up, Megan, what were you hearing about what it meant to be a girl or a woman? <laughs> I mean, from the church, I was hearing uh, get married young, have babies, be obedient, just kind of be docile, cook some food and shut up. And then, uh, you know, I, I also have another side to my story, which is that my dad is a very academic person who also sent me to a very like strict, hard school where it's very like achievement. Girls can do anything. So I, I had a lot of confusing messages. It was very weird. Wow. That is, I mean, the internal conflict that you were probably feeling from one day to the next. How did you make sense of any of it or did you? Uh, luckily, I was just bad at both things. Like I, I was bad at <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> in the church I was bad at the school like I had no idea what was going on so I think I just like completely disassociated and made up a little 
fake world in my brain. And um, that probably saved me from a lot of stuff because there's a lot to unpack now, but my childhood wasn't too bad looking back. Okay. Right. I mean, dissociation is a gift at times. Yes, it really is. And there are people who will leave also having been given a harder time in their group because they didn't achieve and they weren't believers and they didn't raise in the ranks and they didn't do everything. But there are also the ones who there's something inside of them that just didn't feel motivated or it didn't feel right. And so they leave sometimes they're able to kind of get healed a little bit more quickly, even though sometimes they've been more mistreated in the group, but because they didn't succumb to as much of the programming, you know? Yeah. My thing was very much just like being an angry teenager whose face was like this, like angsty face. Yeah. I was like Gothic almost, you know, like a emo kid. And like, I couldn't have been more like, I hate it here. So my mom would just always be nudging me and I'd be like, nope, can't do it. Cannot smile. <laughs> uh huh. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that sometimes for a lot of people, when they're in these groups, they do almost feel like smiling is like performance art because that is not at all how they're feeling inside, but they have to kind of pretend if they're not going to be given a hard time. Right. That face that you made, which is a sort of consternation and patience, you know, try to impress me. I doubt you can, you know, uh, I'm glad. I'm glad you actually had that because sometimes people will say that they they left feeling like two different people. And they, they're having to integrate into one person again because they had sort of their cult outward persona and what was happening inside, all the things they couldn't say and all the things they couldn't express. Megan, what do you remember wishing that you could say or that you could express? The need to be perfect is so insane in this group. It, it is just, I would have loved to be more honest about my feelings. I would have loved to talk about things I was genuinely interested in. You know, I wasn't allowed to go to dance classes or wear makeup or like go on a date with a boy, anything. I wasn't allowed to do anything or say anything or, or, you know, I I would have loved to express myself is what I would have loved to express. (laughs) And it was just not happening. So I I actually sent uh, Megan an article, which probably has occurred to her much, much earlier than it occurred to me, but about how um, growing up in sort of an extreme religious situation, it can be correlated with OCD in adulthood, which I thought was fascinating and makes total sense for an upbringing like yours, where it is just like constant, rigid, constant, like having to question your own thoughts. I mean, even I, I also had that experience, but I don't think it was quite as extreme. Every day, like kids in the two, two by twos, it's very like God knows every single hair that's on your head. He knows every thought that's in your head. I would like sometimes pull out a piece of hair and be like, I wonder if he knows there's one less. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Like, yeah. And of course I have crazy OCD. I'm a psychopath because how can you think that way? Like that there's some mean man living in your brain. It's so weird, you know, like it's awful. Yeah. Yeah. I had the mean man in my brain too, for sure. Yeah. I love that idea of pulling out a hair and (laughs) trying to see if you noticed. There are all these moments that that can go unnoticed by people outside that might feel like nothing things, but to you are huge. And it's a huge test. And it's a test also, I think, to see how free you are. Like if this person is going to notice this or not, and if not, then what else am I free to do? Because I think we're, you know, growing up in these environments or even just life in general, we're kind of wanting to do this, like push the walls out and see how much space we have and how much freedom we have. And it's hard when the walls are right here or inside. The mean man was also in your head, Lola. Yeah. I mean, just from traditional Mormonism, not even from the prophet situation. I mean, there's just so much emphasis on like not having any sexual thoughts whatsoever, which I know is like, we're all messed up from (laughs) from our religions sexually. That was a big thing for me. And just like constantly worried that I was going to somehow, you know, make a demon appear or something because I was having too many sinful thoughts or just be disappointed or not get to be with my parents in heaven. I mean, that's the ultimate threat is like, you won't get to 
go to the same tier of heaven. You won't get to be with your family for eternity when you die. For me, it largely centered around sex. I think that was the biggest one for sure because I was a really good student. I didn't really rebel in any way. Like I, I didn't feel, but when it came, well, when it came to expressing myself in clothing, that was one, but also just like, I was a little child with sexual repression who was like having feelings and didn't know what to do about them and got caught drawing, whatever. Like it became this sort of obsessive, like push that down, push that down, push that down, push that down. God's going to stop you from getting into the celestial kingdom. Right. I mean, the threat that looms over you is so great that it becomes easier, I think, to not take the risk, but then you lose sight of kind of who you are and you don't have a chance to find out what is quote unquote normal. A lot of people think they have exaggerated needs, that there's something really abnormal about them rather than it being a part of sort of natural development. And so I know there are people who will sometimes then take child development courses after having left a cult just to see that they were normal. It's really actually helpful to have a wow, frame of reference. That's cool. Right. Yeah. That's super interesting. Right. Because you want to know that you're not odd man or odd woman out and you want to have a frame of reference that is real. So I'm curious. I know that we're smushing a lot in a short amount of time, but I would love to hear from both of you about what your kind of exit story is and how you left and what the tipping point was that was the impetus for you leaving. So Megan, what was it for you? I mean, to be honest, going to college, it was kind of like, bye, you know, see you guys later. Um, to that point in time, my curfew was 10 o'clock at night and there was no, I'd never gone out later than that, pretty much. There was no, nothing around that. So uh, suddenly I was free. I was in college a long ways away from my parents and that was the end of that. And I really haven't had any formal conversation with my parents about it, but I did text my dad that I want to talk a little bit about some stuff when I come home for Thanksgiving and he um, ignored me and answered a different question. So we'll see, but um, (laughs) that's where we're at so far. Yeah. I just want to be like, dude, you can't tell little kids because I got my graduate degree in psychology and like, it just doesn't work. You can't tell little kids this stuff and have it be healthy for them at all. You can't tell a little kid like, you know, tonight God might come back. He hates us all. And like, you'll burn forever and uh, you better be good. So you can come to heaven with us. Like what? No, that's mean. So I just, he's a rational person. So I want to be like, what were you doing? Cause that was way too crazy. We'll see. Yeah. It's hard when you, when you want to have those conversations, it all depends upon sort of what the goal is of the conversation. I mean, kids of any age still want their parents to acknowledge. They, they want them to say, you know, I'm sorry, or I get what, why you're feeling this way, or just hear you out without getting defensive. Although there are some parents who will still get defensive or will ignore it or will turn it back on you and, you know, do all of that. So then sometimes the goal gets refined as, I just want to have a chance to say this out loud to this person and have him hear it, no matter how he responds. The important part is that I said it. So I would hope that you could hang on to that no matter what his response is. Thank you. I hope I can too. I think, I think I'll be able to, I think so. Okay. Okay. Good. I mean, then you're really exercising your freedom, which is a lovely thing. And I think also going to school, I wonder what it was like for you to be in school where suddenly you could have a different opinion or you could ask a question. Yeah. Um, while I was in college, I wasn't thinking about any of that stuff a lot. I was just drinking and having fun for the first time in my life being an idiot. But once I moved to LA, when I graduated college, it was when I started to get into a lot of philosophical discussions and really good therapy and kind of unwinding a lot of it. And just that's when it really started to resonate. But honestly, this podcast is probably what's taken it to the next level. And I feel like I'm disseminating some more stuff right now because uh, there's still a long way to go. I, I'm not where I want to be yet. You know, I want to be completely free. I want to not have this fear. It's so weird because I, do, I, I rationally know that it's not right, but it's just 
when your parents still completely believe something and you love your parents and your parents are smart people, it's really hard to reconcile with your inner child that they're just completely wrong and you can make your own way. It, it feels weird, especially with a childhood that was so controlled to find that kind of power and choice within is just totally different. Yeah, it is. It is. Okay. So that is a really good goal though for you. And, and I'm, and I, I wish you well along that journey and that you both have gifted yourselves actually with the podcast, which I want to be able to talk more about. I think also when you're at a place where you feel you want your parents to be, especially, or any family member who's still involved, but especially parents, it would seem to me like that you might be saying that you're at a different place psychologically, that there's a certain independence or strength or courage that you have that other people might not or might not yet right and I think also as parents I think if you brought your children up in something it would be harder not impossible but it's harder to look at what you did to your children so there's I think more internal defensiveness uh, that you have to kind of get through uh, just to have them hear you out so Sorry, it can feel like an uphill battle. I know, but I wish you well with that. Thank you. So Lola, for you, what was your kind of breaking point? Well, so there there are a couple different ways to look at that, I guess. The first one would be the literal like breaking off from or separation, I guess, from the belief system which was I was 12. I was living with another family because he had basically commanded that my mother send her children away. She did not do as he asked, but my brothers went to live with my dad and then I wanted to be near her. So I stayed with a, just like some family from church. So basically one day my mom showed up and I had been having what I now recognize as doubts. I wasn't, I couldn't really name them as that at the time, but uh, my mom came to get me one day and sat me down outside and was like, this man came to the place I'm living. She was living in this like awful halfway house where she was very badly abused. And it was just very dangerous situation. I visited her there a couple of times, but she basically said a man came and told her that it was all a lie. And she had been questioning and begging for him to not have her in this horrible situation. And he kept insisting that she stay. So she, she, so as soon as it was like, as it was like broken to her by someone who knew the guy firsthand and had been told by him firsthand that it was all bullshit. He broke down crying. He had come there to have sex with her. He like couldn't bear it emotionally and like got her out of there. And then she came to get me basically. Wow. So we were saved, unfortunately by a man, um, but fortunately <laughs> saved. <laughs> and, um, and then the process of, you know, kind of extricating ourselves just emotionally was a much longer ordeal. And, you know, my mom was very traumatized for years and I had secondhand trauma, which I'm still (laughs) unpacking. But I think once I, again, back to the, back to sex, once I started having sex as a grown adult and was feeling a lot of guilt and a lot of shame about it, that was when I was sort of forced to reckon with all of the beliefs that were hiding inside me that I didn't want to deal with anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So the secondhand trauma is something that actually I haven't talked about as much as I probably should on this show. Um, And so can you explain just a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, watching, first of all, when my mom and I were separated, I would like hear all this pain in her voice and not know what was happening, but like be very worried about her. And then once we were reunited and we like, it was a whole ordeal finding a place to live. That's another story. You know, she was, she was traumatized. She would dissociate. She would not be all there sometimes. She was like, she'd been horribly abused beyond most people's imagination and was still managing to be a single parent and like feed her children while that was happening. But like the result was that she would have to dissociate and like she was triggered especially when she started telling her story and a couple of different like outlets or publications or authors told it wrong and kind of misrepresented her and were a little bit victim blaming. And that was when I really saw the trauma come out. And it's only really recently that I'm recognizing like, oh, there's a reason I like tense up when I hear about certain things, my whole body like tenses. And there's a reason I like started experiencing dissociation for the first time myself, you know, and and there's just, I'm learning so much (laughs) now about 
about what's happened emotionally, what the process has been, because it was all shoved away for so long, you know. Right. You know, there is something that happens sort of um, the secondhand trauma and also things generationally in the decisions that a parent makes based on their own history. And also exactly as you're saying, if you are an observer and if you care about a person, you're going to notice the tone of voice that they're using. You're going to hear the sounds they make. You're going to notice when they're present and when they're not. And you're going to try to understand it and also not take it personally, which is hard for a child. It's very hard. And to, I think, understanding where it came from, that it's not because of you or it's not because of anything happening between the two of you, I think can be really nice and kind of reassuring, actually. Yeah, yeah. We've been working on that in EMDR, folks. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's a good place. Good place to do that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I'm wondering, just as we're finishing up, how did the dynamic duo meet each other and then start your podcast? We had a mutual friend. I had been like looking for someone to do this with and I hadn't found the right fit. And randomly, a, a pretty good friend of mine was like, oh, wait, what about my other pretty good friend who grew up in a cult who is in comedy? I'm like, oh, Yes. And then Megan and I, we just got along really well. And it was, it was a match. So you met each other, you started the podcast and it, it is very healing. I'm wondering if there was some nervousness about being out there about your stories. Oh God. Yes. Yes. I'm still not using my full name because it's just so, I don't want to be, you know, the lead. Leah Rimney of the two by twos. I don't want to be everybody mad at me and my parents like disowning me and all that stuff. Um, it's not, it, it, and, and when you speak out about it, you're automatically bitter and just, it's like kind of this middle school, like you're just jealous. You're not saved. Like it's so frustrating. So, um, it's been, a secret <laughs> because it's been so traumatizing. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that whole idea of dismissing people who are speaking out about their experience. I mean, you're not even speaking out against it. You're just saying, this is what happened to me. You're just stating facts, but still you're bitter. I mean, just going back to the Leah Remini idea, right? You would be called a whole bunch of things, but an SP is sort of the worst, the suppressive person idea in Scientology is the scariest thing to be called. And so you, you're always defamed. Well, always, but there are always names for you. All right. But you still push through that and have continued. So that's taken a lot of bravery. Thank you. Wow. And for you, Lola? For me, um, you know, I first, I actually wrote an article about my mom and I, our story um, back in 2015. So I'd gotten pretty comfortable talking about that. And we just knew so many survivors that it felt like a no brainer to me. It felt like something I'm like, just naturally very curious about it. Um, the only thing I would say I had fear about was just that cult leaders are litigious. They, they like to sue. They, you know, I, I say that I um, don't name my guy because I don't want him to sue me. The truth is I'm actually not afraid. He's tried to sue me before and I'm not afraid of him. I know that I have a better case than he does, but uh, I, d I just don't want it feed into his narcissism by get, making him more famous. <laughs> but yeah, no, the, for me, the fear is just like retaliation from cult leaders, retaliation from narcissists against my guests, you know, like that was something that that scared me. But so far we've, we've been okay. So that's good. Good. I'm very glad. I'm very glad. Right. And I think, you know, using the law on their side and still there's so much that needs to be done to have the laws not protect the cult leaders more than to protect their victims. That's been since the beginning and it still exists and it's really wrong. And unfortunately, what cult leaders have going for them is that the thing they do is invisible most of the time. And so it's not as easily provable. I mean, I've worked with a lot of people who said, I wish that I had been hit. I wish I had a bruise to show rather than just an emotional or spiritual bruise. Okay, so just then as we're, we're finishing up, I mean, I, I want to say how powerful it is coming from your backgrounds that you have chosen work where you get to laugh about it because groups like this, they're, they're pretty humorless. So just being able to do comedy, being able to do music, 
because there's always going to be a limit about what music you can listen to and if you can dance or not and all of that. I mean, I think, and also just having, just being able to do something where you use your voice just at all. I think people don't realize how rebellious and beautifully rebellious and healing all of that is from your background. So I'm so happy that you've gifted yourselves with that and also with the rest of the world that get to then hear from you and your guests. And is there anything just kind of a concluding thought? There are a lot of people listening to this podcast who have come out of these experiences, but a lot who are still in, who are kind of using this to build some confidence or bravery to make a decision or to act, uh, to sort of follow their heart. And so is there anything you want to be able to say to them just as we're finishing up, Lola? send this over to you first. Well, first of all, thank you for saying that. I, I appreciate that. I would just say that like, there's a whole community of people waiting. If you haven't taken that leap yet, like there are so many great groups. There are so many people, our podcast, like many of our listeners, like there is a community waiting for you. So if you don't, if you're worried about losing that one, you will find a new one. And also it's like, freedom is beautiful. It tastes so good. It, it's so nice to be able to just do what follow your own heart and do what you want to do and not be under someone else's control. And for many of us, it takes time to kind of get those voices out of our head, but you can, you will. Mm, beautiful. Very hopeful. And you're right. People are worried about suddenly being alone and they won't be. You're absolutely right. Uh, okay. And Megan, how about you? Oh, I, I mean, I love what Lola just said. And I, I also think maybe just letting yourself have as much time as you need, but also honoring that when you know, you know, and it's never going to feel like the right time to change something so huge, but there is a community waiting for you. There are people who've done it. And if, if you know, and it might be time. So just t take your time, but also do it if, if you know it's what you want and need. I think that's very powerful, especially we were talking about OCD. So people are holding themselves up, I think, to a certain standard after they are in groups like this, where somehow they're supposed to be better sooner and they're supposed to figure things out. And you're right. You can't really rush it. I mean, you can avail yourself of different information and talk to people and, but still, yeah, check in with yourself and have yourself be the leader of this, not some idea of perfection and come on, come on, come on. How come you're not fixed yet? Yeah. Cause that's Ooh, unfair. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I can relate to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. So to both of you, thank you so much for your time and for the work that you're doing and giving other people a voice as well. And I look forward to listening to more episodes of your podcast and hopefully speaking to both of you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. My pleasure. My pleasure. Just before I do the one more thing before you go, I want to be able to mention two things. One is that people have been contacting me about the support group that I run on Zoom every other Wednesday evening, Pacific Standard Time from 6 to 7.30 p.m. And it is for former cult members, for people who have been involved in controlled and controlling relationships, also for loved ones who are concerned, who want to be able to help their loved one and kind of reach out to them and want to know how to do it more successfully, or for loved ones who have people who have left very, very controlled situations and are noticing the after effects and want to be able to address them with more knowledge or sensitivity, with more awareness. And so there is a really wonderful opportunity for people in those situations to not only ask me questions, but to speak to people who have been in those situations themselves to get some guidance. So please contact me at my private email. BernsteinLMFT at gmail.com if you want to share some personal information with me to let me know what your interest is in participating in the support group. And also please pass the information on to others if you think they are interested. 
Also, I wanted to let you know that I have a book I wrote a number of years ago about divorce. There were many clients I worked with who were dealing with divorce, and I really wanted there to be a children's book where it was children talking to children. I had collected information from children themselves who had been in these situations who really wanted to be able to share what it was like for them, but also to share what they kind of wished their parents or caregivers of any kind had known about what they might have needed during that time. There's a journal in the back of the book where you can write down what you're going through. Parents or caregivers can write messages to their kids. And there's a place also one year later to check to see how things have been going and what still might be needed and what's been helpful during that first year of transition. It was important to me to write it also from a perspective of having parents where the gender is not specified so that this is for every family. And also, there are plenty of people I work with, obviously with the population I work with, who have been involved in cultic situations where there actually is a high instance of divorce, where people coming out of controlled relationships, very often mm, there is a custodial argument, awfulness that goes on for a prolonged period of time. It's really quite, quite powerful and can be quite traumatizing. But also, a lot of people will feel that they have to choose the group that they're in, the belief, uh, the leader that they have over their children. And children are often kind of put in the middle or really discarded. And again, there is a high instance of divorce. So if this is something you're interested in looking into or purchasing, you're welcome to check it out. It's called Now I Know, Kids Talking to Kids About Divorce. There are a lot of Now I Know books on Amazon. So check it out, maybe under my name. Or also you can go to my website at rachelbernsteintherapy.com and you can order it through there. I hope it's helpful to you or to anyone else you know. And now, one more thing before you go. Thank you to Lola and to Megan. It was really nice to have them on my show. It was also really fun to be on their show, which came out a couple weeks ago. So check out their Trust Me podcast. I loved being a guest on it. And in fact, I had a chance to answer some personal questions that I don't usually talk about on my show because I'm so busy being the one to ask the questions. So it was kind of fun, fun turnaround. And they are really great. They are smart, as you've heard, and they care about the issue of freedom and also about educating people, getting their experiences to be turned into education, prevention, insight. And one of the things that was really important, I think, that I highlighted when I was talking to them was about how when people are in situations where they're not really able to use their voice, they're not able to express themselves, they're not able to speak openly, to speak honestly. While it happens across genders, it seems to happen more often than not with women, with girls, where their voice is highly limited or stifled. And so to have women who have gone into comedy, who are musicians, who are using their voices specifically to share their stories and to be fearless. And I think that that is a huge departure from the way they were raised. So it takes a lot to get to that point when you've been made to feel that there would be something terribly wrong with you speaking up in that way or that that would be punishable or punishable by God. 
I love how many people have podcasts. I love how many people are writing books. I'm trying to start to put one together now of my own. And as soon as I find a way to have the time to finish it, I will finish it. But I think what's really important is to talk about the secrecy, the talking, talking about talking, how important it is to talk. One of the things that I mentioned was Robert J. Lifton, and he's someone who people in my field have studied. We truly respect his work. And in his book from 1961, Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism, there is this chapter 22 in the book that, again, people in my field have usually studied and memorized where he talks about these eight criteria of really authoritarian control. And he talks about milieu control, mystical manipulation, the demand for purity, the cult of confession, sacred science, loading of the language, doctrine over person, which we talked about today, and dispensing of existence, which is a frightening one. One that I want to go back to is number four of those eight, the cult of confession. So when Lola and Megan were talking today, they were sharing their information with the public. That is something that is usually never done when you're in a controlled organization. Most People also who are in abusive relationships learn the lesson often the hard way that they are not to share what's happening with the public about what is happening to them behind closed doors. And so the inverse happens where there is the need, though, for them to confess in-house with their controllers, to their controllers, where they have to share Mm, so much of their thoughts, anything they did that they need to report. They need to share everything, every urge that they had, anything that would have been seen as a sin. And that information within a cultic system and within a controlled and abusive relationship is used against you. I know in Scientology, they, they keep a whole file on you with the private information you've shared with them. And in other organizations, in a group that started out as the Boston Church of Christ, and now the International Churches of Christ, and it's gone through other permutations, they even have something called a sin study. You have to sit down and share sins. The more, the better. In fact, there if there aren't enough on the list, they actually are disappointed with you. So a lot of people actually conjure up other ideas just to have a longer list so people will be happy with them. And so when you know that your sharing of information is going to be used as a justification to abuse you, a justification to control you, because what you're sharing is that you had, let's say, lustful thoughts. What you're sharing mostly is just what is normal human behavior, but is seen as sinful or is seen as a betrayal, or is seen as you being out of control, then it is a way then, or as an excuse, really, a justification for them to take away your freedoms, even more of them, and to also try to convince you that you cannot trust yourself, and you therefore need them to control you. So we find out about how powerful our voices are when we don't get to use them in the way that we want to use them and with whom. And I love the fact that there are people out there who are now talking and are pushing through the fear and pushing through that first time when they're saying something out loud. And a lot of people I know who I've worked with, when they share what's happened, even the abuse that they've incurred, they will break out into a sweat, even look over their shoulder to see if someone's going to be coming after them for sharing it. 
So just to get to the point where people are open takes a lot of doing. So I applaud people like Lola and Megan who have gotten there and then some. And they're also now giving other people a forum to share their voice. So for all of you, keep speaking, but make sure that you're speaking to the right people. Make sure that you're not disclosing information because you were told you have to. Make sure you're not disclosing information in-house with people who say that you need to, and it's a sin if you don't. Make sure you're not sharing information with people who will be using it against you under the guise of kind of it being for your own good. What is for your own good is to be able to make the decisions about how you share and with whom and what you share. And also, I want to end by saying, even though I'm in a talking business between doing therapy and podcasting, I always want to remind people that just because you're asked a question doesn't mean you have to answer it. A lot of people who leave controlled environments are so used to having to answer a question asked of them, especially by someone in a position of authority. And it really is okay. And it should be okay for you to say, actually, I'm not sure I know you well enough to share that. Or I don't know how you're going to respond yet if I share it. So I'm going to hold back. And that is an answer. And you don't have to share information before you're ready. It's your information. Use it well. Use it wisely. And withhold it wisely. Talk to you next week. Thank you very much for listening. Please support Indoctrination on Patreon at patreon.com slash indoctrination. Be sure to give us a follow on our social media. Find us on Facebook and Instagram using at Indoctrination Podcast. And for Twitter, find us at at underscore Indoctrination. We love hearing from you too. So send us an email at indoctrinationshow at gmail.com. And for more updates on the show, visit our website at www.podpage.com forward slash Indoctrination.